there are very few projects with the same integrity as Bitcoin. Syscoin is hands down one of those. I had the opportunity to interview lead core developer and co-founder of Syscoin, Jagdeep Sadhu. And let me tell you something, I learned so much from talking to this guy that we ran over time and we really have to divide this podcast into two parts. So here's part one. Welcome to Rectified Radio, from the latest in crypto news to educating the public. We aim to fight FUD and have fun talking blockchain. Fun segments, interactive guests, and more. This is Rectified Radio, powered by Viperfid. All right, I'm with lead core developer and co-founder of Syscoin, Jag Sidhu. I like to call Sys the perfect blockchain in between Bitcoin and Ethereum, but please tell us a little bit more about how everything came to be. And, and first of all, how you doing, man? Good. Yeah, thanks for having me, Alex. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we've been working hard since around 2013 um we came from you know the bitcoin crypto anarchist point of view of uh trust uh no no trust verify first then trust and um you know the libertarian point of view of money uh decentralized money and decentralized currencies powering settlement using the blockchain as a kind of like a court system and we quickly you know we realized that you could do more than just store the, that currency you could do applications on top um, but you know of course you don't want to extend it too far which is ethereum went a little bit too far and decided that we're going to do general purpose computing um, satoshi actually had uh, the ability to do that if you wanted to but we you know took those off codes out of bitcoin because they weren't um, you know it's not supposed to be for Turing completeness because it's uh, the costs go uh, up really fast uh, so you can see the the Bitcoin fee market is a little bit more stable. The Ethereum one's a little more erratic, and you know the Ethereum developers. <laughs> yeah, and then there's opcos that they're disabling or reducing costs because you know they haven't tested their system to scale and it's hitting those issues for the first time. I'm sure there's a lot more, but they're moving off of that model anyways, and they're going into proof of stake, which is very risky and sharding. <clears throat> you know, since we're kind of behind Bitcoin. We were merged mine with Bitcoin as well. Um, the largest pools are mining uh, Bitcoin, but um, they're able to mine Syscoin with that, that same nonce that solving blocks on Bitcoin, they're also solving them on Syscoin. And then uh, two of the core components we've been working on, you know, it can't be just a fork. You have to right. provide value. Our value would be uh, interoperability and scalability. So uh, interoperability really is just... Uh, uh, our, our customers uh, from Blockchain Foundry side, the, the company that develops on the protocol, get a lot of requests to do different smart contract ethering things type. But we also want um, the scalability of payments, which is the majority use case of blockchains. Yep. And so to marry those concepts, you know, we created the bridge. So it lets our users go over to Ethereum trustlessly without anyone in between. Uh, to leverage smart contracts, but then also it's a way for Ethereum to also offload to other chains. So we're seeing it uh, as a general purpose skill uh, for Ethereum. Uh, we entered the Reddit challenge. So the Reddit was the Reddit community has a scaling issue and they want to use side chains or bridges to help solve their problem, um, even though they're ERC-20 uh, contracts. Um, so, you know, those, that was interoperability and scalability. We um, researched to do payment channels and to do on-chain scaling. So on-chain scaling, kind of like Bitcoin Cash and BSV, we, we're we not proponents of just increasing the block size and then hopefully crunch more transactions into the block. But um, talking about walking up to a merchant and paying, uh, walking back out within five to ten seconds, uh, right. That doesn't mean you block time down to five to 10 seconds. But what we mean is, you know, probabilistic approaches to solving those in a way that uh, you're able to securely pay for something and the merchant can let you walk away with that service after you pay. 
So we have like a, a DAG concept in, in our system that just analyzes the mempool um, through its you know interconnected web of dependencies of the transactions and uh, analyze if there's double spends. And really the only difference between that and what Bitcoin does is we propagate double spends. So in Bitcoin, the double spends, if it's not, if you don't have the replaceability flag on, which means you can't replace the transaction, if it's a double spend, it gets rejected outright from the memory pool. And so you can't actually detect that reliably as a merchant or anyone watching Bitcoin blockchain. You can't um, know if, uh, if a transaction is coming into the memory pool, you will not know until it gets into the block if it's able to be trusted. Whereas we do propagate double spends and we assign a little bit of a, a fee, higher fee for the extra bandwidth potentially that it takes to propagate those, you know, ZDAG transactions, we call them. Um, so the ZDAG transactions, you know, double the, the bandwidth costs so that nodes aren't encumbered with uh, spam attacks, but also propagate any potential double spend. So if you do try to double spend it, um, the merchant would know. And then the merchant's waiting some amount of time, five to 10 seconds to know if he sees a double spend. Uh, he calls a service, the service tells him no double spends, and then he, um, customer can walk away after a few seconds. Uh, so there's different optimization techniques applied to that, but really that's, uh, that's called on-chain scaling. This is happening on the blockchain. And, um, uh, that was if gonna a, be my next question, if it was all on-chain versus off-chain, because from my understanding, you guys provide off-chain solutions as well, right? Yeah. So it's it's probabilistic and it's also opt-in, meaning if you're doing like a million dollar transaction, you're probably going to go fall back to the Bitcoin policy and we offer that. Um, but off-chain uh, and, and, and for microtransactions, you can use this. And where we're headed towards is uh, obviously off-chain payments for scale. Um, so if you're talking about billions of people using this system, it's going to need to be off-chain, but using the same trust model of on-chain. Right. So, you know, with Lightning Networks, they, they're getting pretty far, but it's only one currency. It's just Bitcoin. Um, what we want to offer is multi-currency. So your stable coins, your other coins all come to the same network and inter interoperate, maybe exchange value, maybe pay in one currency, a merchant gets another. All sorts of things are possible. And uh, you only fall back to the on-chain if there's ever an issue. Um, so luckily, we, you have ZDEG there. Uh, if, if you hit, have to hit on chain, but otherwise, you know, most of the transactionality will be either bridge related or, uh, or ZDAG. Uh, and then the rest of them likely will be off chain. That's the, what we see as a vision of how, you know, payments are going to evolve in the blockchain space. Right. It, it really seems like you've got most angles covered when it comes to all this. And just to clarify for those, you know, who may be, not be aware of all the complexities that are involved, because crypto has become a space where many just want to invest and make money and to each their own, right? But what I like about SIS is its integrity with Bitcoin. And many, you know, it's not just a, many confuse it and say it's a, you know, a layer two solution for ETH, but no, not at all. Like SIS is a proof of work coin, right? And it fits right in between with the payment channels, which is where literally almost everything is headed toward or needed in, in the blockchain space for actual mass adoption. Yeah, the payment channels are interesting because, because the coins themselves are um, non-fungible. Like when, they're, when you have a UTXO-based system, you have a set of coins and you have to completely spend them and send change back to yourself. And that itself is another non-fungible um, set of coins. Um, it makes it easy to do payment channels and linked channels all linked to each other, um, have routing in between. So in the accounting model, it's hard to do that in, in the Ethereum, but in the uh, UTXO model, it's more much more efficient. So you can almost, almost say that the design of Bitcoin was geared towards this off-chain solution that naturally ended up being created because the ability to link payments, um, the ability to know that one payment is specific to that money 
and that money is not interchangeable with another transaction. Um, so doing that lets you build these payment rails off of the blockchain, but still have the same trust model uh, as on chain. In case anyone, you know, messes up, they can always use the blockchain as a port system to repudiate or resolve any issues um, and and send back the money or punish those that are uh, right. acting honestly. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a really awesome feature. So we we've got the um, when it comes to sys, we've got the bridge, and it feels like you guys originated with the bridge and now now is when we're starting to hear all these talks about interoperability interoperability and things like that but i feel like you guys were like the number ones to do that but now you're seeing like the oracles you're seeing um everyone you know claiming to have a bridge what makes this a little bit different and unique compared to you know these other options that people have yeah, we, we usually the first to um, see these trends unfold, it seems like. Um, with ZDAG, we started around 2015, and uh, that was before interoperability became a thing. Even before um, uh, scalability was a big issue, I think that was around the time the big blocks debate happened, and so blocks weren't even full yet. And we were thinking about on-chain mempool scaling for payments. And uh, with a bridge around 2017, we researched trusted execution environments and different ways to bridge chains, and we did this. So it's a, a first to market type of thing as well. Um, there's you know different models for bridging. There's atomic swaps. There's um, there's direct bridging, and then there's a few. I think there's one, one more. Um, oh, just you know you take custody and do centralized. So the, the custodial solution, I think, is coming up more and more now because people are realizing direct bridges are hard or um, there's a lot of problems. And Atomic Swap suffers from liquidity issues. And so, um, you know, with our direct bridge, we can actually offer Atomic Swap models uh, a much better solution without requiring that liquidity. Um, because in, a, in, a, in an Atomic Swap model, when you swap a coin, then you need the other side to... Uh, have liquidity to be able to come back right. um, and in direct bridge you don't need any liquidity issue you just mint and burn uh, but a marriage between atomic swap and direct bridge would allow someone to um, leverage the syscoin bridge to bridge their coin to ethereum but not require liquidity on both sides maybe just liquidity on one of the sides which is a lot more doable and on the centralized bridge which we're seeing more of now uh, people are using custodial providers like Bitco and aggregate, uh, Aggregator or a couple of the other ones that we're seeing that people are storing coins in a regulated custodial environment, but then they're using multi-sig or, uh, you know, consortium threshold signatures somehow to uh, assign value across different blockchains. Yeah, so I feel like... So in inbound requests for to do that sort of thing as well. Um, so it's not like we're limiting ourselves to one but the direct bridge was important for us to show the world that it's possible to have full interoperability uh, between two chains. Right. And I feel like the other methods are more like shortcuts. But when we learned about the bridge, I was, I was like, man, this is a true like solution here. If we can just get this with more chains involved, then, you know, it's, it's kind of game over. Like, here's the solution here's the number one solution that covers like every angle so i'm really looking forward to seeing you know the bridge develop into something bigger that goes you know beyond ethereum so hopefully we can be uh, the pioneers with you know vibravid since we're currently on the tron blockchain but you know you're, you're a developer why do most people focus just on ethereum now like just developing on ethereum there's a couple of it's regulated and so for example when busd wanted to work with us they they didn't want to issue on syscoin and um they didn't want to manage private keys and stuff and so um ethereum was regulated through nydfs uh, but they were open to decentralized approaches because uh it's compliant with regulation just like how bitcoin and ethereum moving around are compliant so some of that was, you know, it's regulated and so large stable coins simply just can't go on other chains that easily. 
um, unless they get the clearance from the regulators. Um, so you're seeing that network effect, it's, it's the first mover advantage. It's really hard to displace, even though there's potentially better solutions out there. Um, but for us, you know, we're positioning ourselves as a halfway between something like Bitcoin and something like Ethereum. So if you need Bitcoin type of capability, or you're on Ethereum, uh, to send and receive simple coin value transfers, then, uh, you'll be able to leverage this coin directly. So, you know, we're, we're fans of what ETH did because it brought something new. We knew there was going to be fee issues. We knew that naturally we'd have to solve those problems. And that's what they're doing now with sharding and, um, level two, like, uh, optimistic rollups and ZK rollups and stuff like that, which is interesting work. But in the end, um, you know, you're not going to, you're never going to have the scale required, um, right. unless you adopt a multi-chain strategy. So, you know, that's what we're kind of showing to the world. Um, and, you know, coming up, you know, people might ask, what do you, what do you see now? And, um, we still see scalability has another leg to go before mass adoption can happen before, you know, the, the UX and UI, um, niceties average joe i think we need one more leg of scalability and that's again going back to payment channels and off-chain for true scalability and solving the problems of multi-currency transfers off-chain um getting that done is is interesting um the other components on the interoperability um the, the next leg of interoperability is to come up with somehow um to do generic bridging so not just ethereum syscoin but potentially have uh, there's some research happening around multi-party computation where um, you know you have some validators like say the syscoin master nodes or some other validator system mm -hmm. um, has a bunch of nodes that uh, create a private key that private key is not known to any one of the validators but to a group of them and uh, uh, you send, you know that private key say a bitcoin address you send some bitcoin to that address now that pretty much that bitcoin is stored in custody in order to move that Bitcoin, you need to have um, a threshold of validator sign off. And uh, so now that Bitcoin is stored in custody, you take take advantage of that by, you know, minting coins on another chain. Could be any, any chain, really. Um, anything, if that system had some type of trigger mechanism, it can trigger a mint somewhere else. And then um, that becomes a strategy for generically holding custody of crypto. Right, that's it's, cool. It's a, a validator model, yeah. And then when you want to move back, then you get the validators to sign off on thresholds. There's obviously still issues with some stuff, like uh, if you move Bitcoin and then ten years later you try to come back and those validators aren't around anymore, then are your coins gone? But you know, I'm speaking to a few cryptographers uh, in the space, and there are potentially solutions around. Um, somehow either rotating those keys regularly or um, a way to get your coins back through majority consensus somehow. So that's kind of the state of where it's at with interoperability. It's people trying to make generic conclusions that you can do this sort of thing. But in general, you know, you're not going to get the same level of security. Um, the direct bridge really is a one-off. Uh, there's going to be no other that we see there's no real other solutions that offer the same type of uh, trust model because we actually have both blockchains knowing about each other on um, Ethereum. You have the Syscoin headers on um, Syscoin. You have all of the Ethereum headers needed to prove, prove value can move across other systems. Like the one I just proposed is a, again, a, a, a validator model where you have majority consensus, but it doesn't have the same level like you're not actually watching the two chains together to to know that the value moved across. You're just getting some type of uh, majority consensus that, yes, I can move coins or I can't. There's no other context to that. So, you know, that because of that, um, it's easy to conclude that, you know, you are trading off some security, but you are adding that convenience of making it generic. So uh, even though those solutions might come around, there's still going to be value in um, something that we did, which was, you know, without trading off the trust model. It's uh, essentially the same trust model as like the, the main chains of Ethereum and the main chains of Syscoin.
Yeah. Now, now the challenge is just getting people to see this value because, you know, all we're, all we're seeing now is, you know, people just sticking to their guns, building on Ethereum, or, you know, they're trying these uh, other DPoS platforms, but, you know, we've seen a lot of problems with those, whether it's, you know, manipulation um, in the form of lack of decentralization or, uh, you know, hacks, uh, so many things, man. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out and, and, and you're educating me here because there's a lot of complexities to this stuff that the average, you know, crypto investor doesn't really understand, but they should, especially with all these DeFi scams going around now. Like, what would you say to a developer coming on to convince them it's best to build on SIS? I think when Satoshi came around and gave us blockchain, I think there was a uh, large confusion in the development space, financial space. Um, the, the, anyone involved was large confusion on what it meant. What, what the consensus system meant, even down to what consensus means and what decentralization means, there's been confusion. Um, Vitalik pointed out the three types of decentralization and distribution, uh, political, logical, and architectural. So b- because there's, we're talking across means and um, different people have different points of view, It's uh, you have the whole different um, archaic web of, Technologies being developed. Um, some are, you know, interesting, and some are um, not that interesting because they just recycle ideas. But you know, the, what I look at is uh, the academic work behind it. They have proofs. They have system where there's researchers behind it, and it's valid. Um, even then, still, like it, it's not just a researcher. It takes. Uh, you know, the, the technology behind Bitcoin was hundreds of years in the making. It was before we we needed to solve the generalized, uh, the general solution. Um, and in order to solve the general's problem, you had to have enough computational power. So whoever Satoshi was or a group had to wait around until personal computers were strong enough for, the, for them to be able to solve the general's problem. Otherwise, one supercomputer could have just broken the system right away. Yeah. And so he developed that solution and there's confusion on what it meant, which is why the maximalists are so hard done by all these other altcoins. That's, that's why is because they, they understood the value, what Satoshi was giving and these other people don't seem to, but um, everyone is working in unison, even though there's a different value, that value will filter itself. I mean, and we've point. seen the market market has valued Ethereum to a certain extent. If, if the Bitcoin maximalists were right, then Ethereum would would never have taken off anywhere. Ripple wouldn't have ever taken off anywhere. But the market has valued it until it's telling you that it's not. You have to um, trust that, you know, in a zero sum game that the market is always right. It's going to tell you it's valued. That tech is valued until it's not. And so right now, Ethereum is valued and Bitcoin is valued but there's still confusion. And so all we can do is try to stick to our, our core philosophies on what we see uh, when we came into the industry and, and develop based on that. So if other people view it the same way, and maybe there's more awareness of this sort of stuff as people become smarter and study that, then um, you'll see more people developing on this. Yeah, the important thing is that you guys are providing solutions to the real world problems. I think the mistake that a lot are making is that they're going wherever there's community, I would say. Like, like for instance, Vibravid, Beatscoin. Why did we choose Tron? Because at one point they had a really strong community and, you know, fast, scalable transactions And you think just because it's blockchain, it's decentralized, it's safe, it's not manipulated, but it's honestly, you know, quite the opposite because so much is is exploited out there. So I think what you guys are doing and how we're all going to grow together, uh, you know, with, with integrity is, you know, through through development, like what SIS does. 
But what's your what's yeah. your thought on the whole like DeFi space? Because I'm seeing some crazy things. I don't really understand a whole bunch of it. Um, I mean, without getting too deep into it, like if you can summarize it for me, like your opinion. What do you What do you think? Uh, it's pretty crazy. There's no inherent utility in any of that stuff. Uh, it's just um, you know, it's elastic supply, and then they're playing with demand, and then recycling that token into other um, Uniswap type environments where there's more elastic supply and less demand or more demand. And so it's just a bunch of people that are um, are playing casino uh, with these tokens, hoping that their value will stick or hoping someone else is going to buy it, like a pyramid scheme. If people thought Bitcoin was a pyramid scheme, I mean, this is, this is the epitome of pyr- pyramiding right there's no uh, actual utility to all these tokens i dude so, i thought i was going crazy i finally talked to someone who's got some sanity that's exactly what i think it is um i don't know if you saw this but tron justin sun you know he's calling it an experiment but essentially you lock up your trx and you mine this sun token and they have a white paper for it and they say this is they pretty much explain how you're mining it the integrity behind the actual mining process. And I say, okay, I get that. But what is the token for and where is the value? And there, yeah, there has no to information on it. Bro, and you know how much the token is selling for? It's selling for like 30 bucks a token right now. It's it's just oh, wow. ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just a fad. It's an ICO phase. I remember when ICO started up, the, they were selling out like, hundreds of millions in minutes right and a lot of them had no business models or any ideas of what they how they're going to build it eos got billions right it got four billion dollars i'll never forget that Filecoin got hundreds of millions it was crazy and there was no models on how to solve the problem it was just buying into the people behind it hopefully they're able to solve the problem you know those levels of valuation are just uh out of the world and, and the DeFi valuations are again out of the world. So, you know, it, it's going to, um, something good is going to come out of it. People are going to realize how to, like, for example, we're, we're trying to do something that's legitimate DeFi with the, uh, the Ethereum agents because we're having issues with fees. They're too high and we need to gamify having other people um, be these agents, which are responsible for taking the Syscoin block headers and putting on Ethereum, right? And because the fees are high, it's costing you know 50k a month or something to um, to put those headers on on, on Ethereum, right? And uh, anyone's able to run that, but no one has reason to run it. Um, they do make some money, like if the the bridge is being used, you get like a one basis point fee out of the token that's being uh, moved across from Syscoin to Ethereum. That's not enough to cover the gas fees though right, right. now, and so we want to gamify that by instead of paying out the the fee to the agent you um every time you propose a super block which is once an hour one agent gets to do that uh, and they're all competing with each other that person earns some reward token right and that reward token could be a DeFi token where you know call it the bridge token uh, the bridge token is rewarded to the super block agent and now there's actually real work behind it and that's the only way to get it is to is to be this agent and then you put that into the DeFi ecosystem through liquidity providers or whatnot and you have a token with real value and you not only earn it um, by an agent but also every time someone uses the bridge those fees that I mentioned that were paid out to the agents when people move those fees and those tokens can be paid out to the holders of uh of that bridge token, right? So right. you get some of the as bridge becomes used, um, people are paid, and then now you have a, a reason to hold that token, and maybe we can extend that further by uh, gamifying incentives to use a bridge. Um, yeah, and, other and than paid to- for the work. That's the thing. Like it's there's a purpose. Like it fits the whole 
the whole system. It, you yeah, know. That, that brick token shouldn't be selling for cheaper than the gas fee plus some uh, <laughs> yeah. plus some percentage, right? A, a, a revenue percentage for the people holding it. Right. So if, if that's true, then that means that we've um, successfully offloaded the cost of running that agent. It's self-sustaining. And that's the goal. It's not to try to hold a bunch of these tokens and get rich. It's to exactly. serve a purpose in making that the bridge between our blockchain self sustainable, uh, regardless of what the fees are. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it's going to be interesting to see that because I do think that, you know, our Beatscoin SVT token will get some traction and we'll be doing, you know, pretty good there. And the more projects that come, they're really going to want to have active because of, you know, the ridiculous gas fees and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically the two core components are that, and then, you know, Bitcoin is interesting is building a business model on top and a token on the token layer. Um, and I like that you guys are doing the multi-chain thing. All right. That's it for part one. Hope you guys were able to soak up that information and really see a new perspective when it comes to blockchain and how Syscoin is really a perfect balance between Bitcoin and Ethereum. See you in part two. Peace. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Rectified Radio Podcast. Stay tuned for our next episode and make sure to check us out on vibrovid.io for exclusive content. Peace. I'm just about that action, boss.